1998 horror science fiction cult classic Cube. Uh, Cube is a sci-fi film that does contain an autistic character. Um, it, the autistic character in this is uh, cliched in many ways um, and problematic in many ways, but also there are some interesting things if we start to read the film in terms of uh, autism and science fiction and this idea of the post-human, which I'm going to come back to later on. So I'll tell you first a little bit about what the film is about. So uh, Cube is, you kind of best think of it as a kind of precursor to the sort of the Saw films and those kinds of films, although it's not quite as horrific and as horrible as those. It's about seven strangers who wake up inside a gigantic prison-like structure, which is this thing, the cube. Um, and inside the cube there are all sorts of little smaller cubes which are the various rooms of the prison um, and some of those rooms are booby trapped and some of them aren't and the seven strangers who uh, meet up inside there uh, they've all got um, sort of jackets on which have got their names on and none of them have any memory as to why they're in there or, or why they've been put in there or, who they, or who's put them there. Um, and they've got to find their way out of this place. That's what they do. They work together to figure out which rooms are booby-trapped and which aren't, and to sort of travel their way through this um, maze, this labyrinthine maze, um, to try and find some sort of escape. And the further they go through the, this, the cube, um, the more stressed out and angry they all get with each other. And uh, some of them meet vis uh, grisly, violent ends, and some of them are able to try and make it all the way to the end of the cube. Um, there is, as I say, there is a uh, an autistic character in this. Um, his name is Kazan, and he comes in at about kind of a third of the way through the film. He's not there from the start. He's not one of the first members of the gang. In fact, one of the members of the gang has already died by the th that, by the time that uh, Kazan arrives. Uh, the rest of the group are all inside one of the chambers and they open up the uh, hatch in the ceiling and uh, Kazan comes tumbling through. Um, and it's quite obvious from the very start that he is uh, autistic. They never um, say directly the word autism at any point, um, but I think it's quite clear that he is autistic. He's, uh, he's, he is verbal, but he only says uh, very few things. Um, he gets very agitated when other people get angry or when the, the situation gets stressful. He has various um, stims. Uh, he's got a very repetitive movement with his, with his hand and his fingers and he also taps the side of his head sometimes as well. Um, he murmurs and he mumbles and he echoes some of the sounds of the kind of mechanics of the cube. Um, so it's quite clear I think that he is an autistic character. Um, there's no clear indication of exactly who he is, where he came from, why he's in the cube, why he's part of this group. Um, he just appears and then has to be part of the of the gang as they try and make their way out of this prison. Um, he is uh, he is so there are a few sort of cliches um, in Kazan's character. He is a liability to the group. He's a burden for the rest of the group. Um, he's uh, he's very quick to, to get agitated. He's he irritates a lot of the other members of the group quite a lot, um, and he uh, yeah he's he's a bit of a difficulty. Um, nevertheless, they do keep him with them um, and try and sort of help him through the various booby trap rooms in order to get to, to try and find this escape. Um, He's also quite clearly also quickly becomes the symbol of innocence and purity. Um, the rest of the characters all, for whatever reason, have some kind of character flaw. Um, some more so than others, but the others do have these various flaws, which means that they are uh, quick to temper, they start to f fight quite a lot, um, the situation gets very heated very quickly, and none of them are particularly likeable people. There's a sort of sense that maybe they have, um, they're, they're all, for whatever reason, have done something horrible and have been um, imprisoned inside here and are now being tested by some sort of giant unseen force. Uh, but, but, but Kazan is exempt, exempt from all of that. He is this, um, this, this symbol of innocence and purity. And so, therefore, he is the one that needs to be protected and, and helped all the way through. And, and there's a point where he very nearly... Um, causes the death of one of the others and the, he starts 
getting sort of thrown around and beaten up, but uh, the others intervene and, and, and protect him. So yeah, there's this, there's this sense that he is this pure and innocent person that needs needs protecting. Um, um, there's a bit of a spoiler here. So I mean, if you haven't seen the film, it's probably worth going and watching it before you watch the rest of this video, because I am going to talk about some spoilers. And this is the main spoiler that I'm going to reveal at the moment. Kazan ends up being the only character that escapes from the cube. All the rest of the characters die or perish in various grisly ways um, and Kazan at the very end he's the only one that actually makes it out. Um, so there is this kind of curious sort of message going on uh, in the film I think that it, which is almost quite a kind of religious almost quite a Christian message which is this idea that if you're the innocent and pure non-violent um, person you are the one that will escape the situation you are the one that will get out of the cube. The others, for whatever various reasons, um, don't get out and it is largely due to their petty arguments that they have with each other or their, their madnesses or their violence that they turn towards each other. And Kazan is the only person who is exempt from that, so therefore he is the innocent and the pure one, therefore he is the one that um, it manages to get out and manages to escape. Um, and I'm going to show a, a clip later on of the moment when he... Um, when he actually leaves the cube, uh, where you'll see how this kind of um, this kind of religious theme is, is played out visually. Uh, but uh, yeah, first of all, I think uh, what's interesting about Kazan, even though he's yeah he is this burden to the rest of the group. Or oh, one other thing that ne needs to be said. Um, so he is a burden, and he is uh, 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 perhaps a liability uh, for a long time, up until a point where the situation gets so to a point where it gets too stressful for them all, it gets too much, um, they're all exhausted and they all collapse and they decide, they realise that they're never going to find the way out of this place. Um, the cube itself is set up to be a, a kind of mathematical puzzle, so there's a, there's a number on each of the chambers that determines whether it is or isn't booby trapped and um, one of the other characters who is a kind of math student is able to figure this out as they, as they make their way through cube but as they go further and further the mathematics of the place gets much more complicated and um, to the point at which the the math student basically says um she is not able to do the the maths required to get um to get them through the safe passage because she's not because um, it requires a, a computer in order to do that it's these astronomical numbers that need to be uh, calculated lo and behold at that point, uh, Kazan is revealed to be this mathematical savant who is able to do these astronomical calculations. Um, so there we have the main autistic cliche number one being ticked. Uh, and he, at that point, uh, is suddenly a, a useful figure. He suddenly has some sort of agency. So here, really, he is being used as this narrative prosthesis. For a very long time, he's a burden and a liability. Then suddenly it's revealed that he's got this magical ability to do... Um, to do this astronomical mathematics and suddenly he's useful again. So he is basically just this this prop. This prop for two reasons. To show, uh, to be a kind of a, a, a symbol of innocence and purity and secondly to use his savant abilities in order to help them get to the exit of the cube. Um, however, I think there are a couple of moments in the film, a couple of directorial moments in the film which seem to uh, point towards something quite interesting about the connection between autism and science fiction. And this tends to, I think, happen more in a more pronounced way in sci-fi and fantasy. And this is the connection that is made between Kazan and the cube itself. Now, there's never a, any real explanation as to what this cube is. There are sort of some suggested thoughts and theories that the various uh, members of the group come up with, but there's never any clear revelation exactly what the cube is, who's built it, who's controlling it, why it's booby-trapped, why these people have been put in there, why somebody as innocent and as pure as Kazan has been put in there, um, and what the purpose of all this is. And even at the end, when Kazan escapes, there is no, we don't get any um, revelation at that point as to what is it on the outside of the cube, or uh, who it is that's built this thing, and why these people have been put in there. So it does remain a bit of a, a mystery, which I quite like, actually. It keeps this kind of ambiguous air about it and allows, invites you, I think, as a, as a viewer to make, your own, uh, or make up your own theories and decisions about what it is. 
for example, it could well be that it is a, a sort of um, a sort of purgatory. Perhaps all these people have died, and the cube is a kind of purgatory. And uh, if they are able to navigate the very, very hard, complicated mathematical puzzle of the place and avoid all the traps, then the then the reward is uh, transcendence and 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 heaven. Um, uh, or perhaps it is some sort of elaborate booby trap prison controlled by somebody. Um, but there are all sorts of various theories as to what it could be, and no, and the film itself doesn't explain it. However, there is this connection made between Kazan and the mechanism of the cube itself. Now, I'm going to show a clip in a second to sort of illuminate what I'm trying to try what I'm trying to talk about. Um, so this clip comes in. Um, this is beyond the halfway point. We're getting almost to the to the climax at this point. Uh, one of the main members of the gang has just plummeted to her death and uh, uh, leaves behind four, uh, Kazan including uh, uh, Kazan and th three others. Um, and they are at this point exhausted and they're tired and they've decided that they needed to need to sleep and rest and regenerate for an hour. Um, and so they agreed to do that. And now in this clip, Kazan, you'll see Kazan right, right at the beginning of the clip. He's only in it very briefly. Um, there's a shot, a wide shot of all four of the remaining uh, people. And Kazan is on the left hand side. And you can recognize him because he's doing one of his stims. He's tapping the side of his head like this. Um, and what's interesting about this clip is to listen to the sound. Because what follows is a very brief and slightly kind of warpy dreamlike montage of uh, the people sleeping and of the kind of the walls of the chamber and what's interesting is the music to this um, the score to this to this montage and how the score connects with the sound that Kazan is making with the tapping of his head so I'm going to play the clip now an hour is as long as I say And, uh, tapping the side of his head and the, the noise and the rhythm of that sound then becomes a key part of the music for the rest of that little mini little sequence so the rhythm of his hitting becomes the rhythm of that piece of music and equally the little sort of curious vocal effect that kind of whispering noise sort of echoes the rhythm of his hitting so there's a kind of a layering going on there of the sound as this moves into as we move into this kind of dreamlike sequence, um, which I think is a, is really interesting because it sort of establishes there a connection between Kazan, his uh, his echoing of sounds and his behaviour and his stimming, with um, the the mechanism of the cube itself, but also with the sort of godlike presence that is above all of this. This sort of force which has brought these people together and has built this thing and has trapped these people in there. It makes this sort of connection between Kazan and that presence, whatever that is. And it's never revealed what that is. So we can start to speculate that it is maybe some sort of something alien or something um, angelic or godlike. Um, and yeah, this very clear connection is made here. And I think maybe it, it's established so that it's a kind of precursor to what's going to come at the end when Kazan is um, is escapes and becomes this sort of transcendent figure in a clip that I'm going to show in a little bit in a, in a little bit um, so yeah there's this curious idea that the, the cube and Kazan have this kind of deeper level of connection that the others don't or that the others have lost or ha or ignoring for some reason um, the others are perhaps too worked up by their petty squabbling that leads to a lot of their fighting and their and their problems that the group face whereas Kazan is exempt from that and therefore somehow has a kind of more spiritual connection with the cube so I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show another clip I'm going to show the second clip which is the the bit right at the end when Kazan um, escapes from from the cube so this is that moment and it's very uh, I think there's some very obvious imagery going on here but just watch it before I talk about it um, so here yeah here's that moment
So yeah, there's some very obvious imagery going on there with uh, Kazan being accepted into the light, uh, being transcended into the next phase of existence, his arms open wide like some Christ-like saviour. Um, and it sort of suggests that, that maybe that the theory that this cube is some sort of purgatory or some uh, has been constructed with some by some kind of godlike presence um that clip kind of supports that idea that is the very end of the film there is nothing more from that point the credits roll at that moment um and we don't see where kazan goes or or who is there to greet him if anyone uh, and what happens to him next um it is just a simple moment of transcendence and escape um so all of this uh this that this connection that is being made between uh, Kazan and this being the symbol of purity and innocence, but also being this uh, having this sort of deeper connection with this science fictional prison, um, leads towards I think thoughts about autism and uh, posthumanism. Now, posthumanism is this idea of um, the next phase, I guess, of humanity, which is this world in which we sort of leave behind uh, our, all of our conceptions of what being a human is. And to a certain extent, we're already in the process of doing that um, because in, in two ways, sort of socially, culturally, and also um, technologically, because we're already um, going through a period, I think, of us rethinking what it means to be human, especially when you start to think of things like neurodiversity um, but diversity in all senses, that there is no one pure good way of being a human being, but actually the, the, that's what's best is the, the diversity and the difference within the world of, of, of being a human. Um, and we're starting to recognise that a little more in the modern world, especially with globalisation and uh, developments in various different uh, ways of thinking, including neurodiversity. Um, and neurodiversity is, is perhaps the, the sort of, I would suggest it's kind of the final word in that because it's taking, uh, although we've already started to think about our, our bodies and, and our genders as being different, we're now starting to think about our minds as being not these fixed set um, categories, but by uh, of being sort of very complex and very diverse. And autism is leading the charge in sort of showing us this. So there is already quite a clear connection between autism and, post, and this idea of post-humanism because autism and the neurodiversity movement are sort of showing a new way of being, a new way of existing that has perhaps always been with us, but hasn't really been recognised and appreciated up until very recently. And secondly, uh, uh, post-humanism is suggesting that we're already starting to use um, technology and cybernetics and robotics within ourselves as uh, within our fleshy human bodies that are turning us into um, these ideas of being post-human, of being a kind of cyborg, if you will. Um, and already we can, you know, we can have chips implanted in our brains. We wear various devices that can, uh, that, that help us like hearing devices or even just wearable tech. And we've all got mobile, fa mobile phones that we walk around with. So there's a sense already that we're moving into this kind of interesting idea of being in this kind of post-human world where we're all fused with technology and it's all a little bit cyberpunk um, and yeah and disability theory is very interested in this idea of post-humanism at the moment there's a lot of discussion going on about it there's a lot of debate it's quite a controversial idea and a controversial term but autism is right in the heart of all of that <clears throat> because autism has this um, capacity in some ways to have this kind of already has this kind of m m machine connection, this connection between um, the, the sort of the working of the, the autistic mind, which uses this kind of processor of, of logic and, and almost computing to make sense of the chaotic world. This already connects us as human beings to this idea of uh, a kind of cyborgian cybernetic future where we're all going to have to uh, think in that sort of way as well. Um, so it's interesting that here in this film, in Cube, in, in, a, in a science fictional film, which is a, about transcendence and moving on to a, a different phase of existence, but is also about uh, mathematics and mechanics and um, working things out logically and, and working together to do that. 
Um, there is this suggestion there that boy in this in this film that that autism does lead towards a certain sort of posthumanism, uh, which I think is really interesting. And I think that one of the the, the nice things about this the, like that kind of reading of this film is that there is that it sort of rewards what it rewards is the working together of the neurologically diverse people. So you have the autistic character and you have the people who are the, the members of the group who are slightly more sympathetic towards this autistic character. And when it when that moment comes, that kind of cliched savant moment when it's revealed that he is able to do these wonderful mathematics, um, there is there after that point, there is this working together of the disabled and the abled um, uh, towards this uh, transcendence and this and this moving on to a higher phase of existence and so maybe the film is sort of suggesting look that we all need to work together rather than um, ostracize each other um, and of course the people who do ostracize each other are the ones who are uh, neurotypical and who have to, who are maddened and crazed by the experience of the cube and end up infighting within each other and therefore they are the ones that perish and Kazan is the one to escape. So yeah, there's some very interesting things going on in the film. It's worth a look, it's worth a watch. It's quite an entertaining film in many ways. Um, and although there are certainly some, some <laughs> mid-90s autism cliches going on in the narrative, there are perhaps hints of some more interesting things going on when you start to connect the figure of the autistic person to the um, science fictional world and the science fictional ideas that are present in the film. So yeah, that's it. That's my little video about Cube. Um, if you liked this, like the video, um, subscribe to the Fantastic Autistic and I'll keep doing videos like this. Uh, but in the meantime, stay well and bye-bye.